Ted is, I would say, an authority on historical aviation in Western Australia. You may have seen him on TV. Um, today, he's going to be talking about some historical aspects of aviation. Some short time ago, Ted and I had a talk, and uh, we decided it would be a good idea to go back into some of the origins of aviation in Western Australia and some of the things that took place, which a lot of people don't have a great deal of knowledge about. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Ted Fletcher. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, between the two world wars, 16 people were killed in aviation accidents in Western Australia in 11 separate accidents. Eight of those accidents were very easily explained and investigated. Uh, they were just simple errors of judgment. But three of the accidents uh, always had a bit of an air of mystery about them. And this one that I'm going to talk to you about today is one such. Um, John McIntosh was born in Scotland in 1892, came to Western Australia in 1909, went timber cutting at Pemberton for five years, and then when World War II broke out, he joined up. He couldn't get into the 11th or the 16th Battalion, but uh, he managed to get into the 4th Field Ambulance and spent, uh, I think, around about seven months at Gallipoli, then went back to England, uh, finished up on the Somme as a stretcher bearer, came back to England, applied to join the Royal Flying Corps, and finally, in June 1918, he was accepted, but of course, it was all over. At the uh, repatriation camp at Sutton Veeney, he met a man called Ray Parra, who was a pilot. Macintosh was not. And uh, they were decided that they would go in for the England-Australia air race, which was announced in March 1919. They managed to raise a thousand pounds from a Scottish whiskey distiller named Peter Dawson. They bought a DH-9. By the time they got themselves ready, the race was over because the Smith brothers had already arrived at Darwin. But they thought they'd go any anyway, rate, they had to get back to Australia. So off they went. And they arrived finally in Melbourne seven months after leaving England. And the story of that trip is, is worth a talk in its own right. Um, Macintosh bought, his, bought par as half of the DH-9 with the idea of setting up in aviation. But uh, he thought he'd pop back to Western Australia to see some of his old friends. And he did it the easy way, riding an Indian motorcycle and sidecar across the desert. Mm -hmm. And it took him 36 days. Uh, it was a shame that he didn't approach Indian motorcycles for a, a commission. I think it, they would have done very well on that. But when he got to Perth, he went and saw Norman Brealey <coughs> because he admired Norman Brealey's uh, exercise very much indeed. That's Macintosh and Para by their DH-9. Um, Macintosh couldn't fly. On the trip from England to Australia, Para gave him elementary instruction flying straight and level, but he couldn't take off and land. Uh, he went down to the uh, Langley Park, met Brearley, and wanted to learn to fly. Brearley and Macintosh got on very well together, and it was a very fortuitous situation for Brearley because it was December 1920, and Brearley had had enough of flying. His war wound was still troubling him, and he, uh, he was very tired, he had 16 months of active barnstorming. And uh, so he and Macintosh came to an arrangement that Macintosh would take over the two Arrow 504 Js and carry on barnstorming in Western Australia where he'd left off. Um, it was a little bit of a, a strange arrangement. Trying to work out what actually happened is very difficult in Macintosh's life because not only was very little ever written about him, but Macintosh had a couple of little peccadilloes, and one was bending the truth to a considerable degree. And when you're looking back through the records, it's very hard to work out what really did happen and what Macintosh thinks happened. But uh, uh, he said he bought the Avros, but in actual fact, he got them under a bill of sale arrangement from Brearley, because he didn't have much money. And um, Brearley gave him 11 hours instruction in taking off and landing, and said, right, off you go. <laughs> Now, in March 1921, the uh, controller of civil aviation, Colonel Brinsmead, dropped the axe and said, we've had enough of these accidents and these cowboy flyers. Everyone's now got to get a license 
every aircraft has got to be registered and, uh, and a certificate of airworthiness must be issued. Well, McIntosh got in just before that came in, so he wasn't a registered pilot. Uh, the aircraft were not, didn't have airworthiness certificates. And after 11 hours instruction on taking off and landing, he set off to do his big barn swimming tour. Well, he went up to 2J. He took with him a man called Harold Lilly, who was his manager, uh, one of Brealey's mechanics called Charlie Pern, and a lady accompanied them. And the, te the press, the local press, very tactfully refrained from uh, explaining what her role in the entire exercise was. Um, they got to um, 2J. He did some flights there. They went to Wongan Hills, then Balladew, and on the late afternoon of March 28th, 1921, they arrived at Pathara. It was five o'clock in the afternoon and there was still enough light for flying. He took up two passengers, um, uh, an Alfred Cousins and Mick Lay. Now remember the name Mick Lay because that is quite important. And then the next two passengers were two ladies. But while they were just about to get into the aircraft, two men pushed their way to the front and asked the ladies if they could take their place because they were wheat lumpers loading trucks and they had to get back to work. So the ladies graciously let, stood by and let them get in. The smartest move they ever made. <laughs> um, the Avro took off, uh, it climbed to about 500 feet and then suddenly went into an engine spin, dived vertically and crashed in a paddock about half a mile past the takeoff point. Macintosh and one of the passengers, Alfred Joy, were killed instantly. The other passenger, uh, Arthur Laughlin, suffered broken ankles, broken ribs, contusions, um, and, ge and generally knocked himself around. Well, then the fun started. An inquest was held, and I've read through the accounts of the inquest, and I've never seen so many conflicting reports from witnesses in my life. Some said that one of the passengers stood up, some said they didn't. One said they had a bottle of beer, another said one of them hit Macintosh over the head with a champagne bottle. <laughs> uh, until finally it was virtually impossible to work out what had happened. Interestingly enough, one of the spectators was Stan Brealey, uh, Norman Brealey's brother. And uh, the uh, explanation of why Brealey was there was probably because Norman had a feeling that maybe McIntosh needed an eye kept on him. Um, Brealey gave evidence at the inquest and he made no mention at all of people standing up. The, the press had a field day. It was the first fatal aviation accident in Western Australia and McIntosh was a national hero after his flight from England. Uh, they, uh, the, the flood of emotion in the paper here was really something to read. He, he had a huge funeral, thousands attended. He was buried at Karakata. Uh, there were eulogies by every person who could manage to get onto the rostrum. Um, and uh, then the inquest finally resumed. And after a, a more conflicting evidence, the jury at the inquest brought back a verdict of accidental death and they added the rider with no blame attachable to anyone. <coughs> that was the result of the crash. As you can see, it was certainly terminal. Now, the, the man, Mick Lay, who had the, the, the first flight, his son was present at the scene. He was 20 year old, very fit. And when the crash occurred, he ran to the wreck in fact, he was the first person to arrive. And in his emotional state, he pulled out a cigarette and lit it Ooh, oh no. and threw the match down on the ground and then realised that that was a pretty stupid thing to do, so he stamped it all out and then thought, there's no smell of petrol. And the fuel tank ha had broken and was lying across McIntosh's body and it was bone dry. And uh, uh, he said nothing. He was not invited to the inquest, but 60 years later, as an 80-year-old man in Bustleton, he decided he would put down on paper just exactly what did happen. Uh, he claimed that the men were not drunk. Uh, many of the witnesses had said both Joy and Lachlan, the other passenger, were drunk. 
Uh, he said the aircraft took off, was flying straight and level, and the engine stopped. And the aircraft then went into a spin, and of course at 500 feet, McIntosh didn't have the experience or the height to regain control. Uh, he claims that the petrol tank was dry because the aircraft had never been refuelled when it came from Balladew. So all of a sudden, all these incredible stories about drunken passengers and people being hit over the head took a bit of a nosedive. But unfortunately, we're in the position where we don't know. It's a little bit like the HMAS Sydney. There's lots of theories, but we don't really know what happened. Uh, but we do know that uh, these were the first two killed in, in Western Australia. Um, Macintosh was buried, buried at uh, Karakata, and a public subscription was raised to uh, erect that headstone. He had married in England and had a son. Uh, a, a public subscription was raised to bring them out to Western Australia, and the, and the government bought them a house, the widow and the, and the child. She married later on at Mr Townsend, and John Macintosh Jr. went on and flew with the RAAF in World War II, but he was a pretty hopeless case. He got into a lot of debt, finished up fleeing his creditors, and generally a bit of a bad hat. Um, it's interesting to surmise what would have happened if Macintosh had continued with the success that Brealey had, um, but we'll, that's something we will never know. Um, Brealey recovered the second Avro because uh, he really still owned it, and. Um, that was the, the end of that type of barnstorming in Western Australia. Thank you very much. Oh.